What is up everybody? It is Scott the Dog Dad here from dogdadofficial.com and rockfeeding101.com and I am sitting down once again with Ronnie Lejeune and we're going to talk about some exercising puppies stuff. So how are you Ronnie? I'm doing good. I'm hanging in there. I caught up on some much needed rest. I had That's a break from training dogs so I'm rejuvenated and ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> Back to the crazy, psychotic, full Google Calendar schedule. Yeah, pretty much. I was surprised that we were able to set this up so fast. Usually it's like, all right, well, I got something in maybe six weeks, but. <laughs> well, what I've been doing lately is making sure that my Fridays and Saturdays are open just for me. Good call. So, Fridays and Saturdays lately have been, I know I could put stuff like, like this on those days because I have to start giving me time off. <laughs> yes. You can't burn out. You can't be a good dog trainer if you can't, right. you can't stand. <laughs> so for those people that haven't seen you before, I, we did a previous interview more about raw feeding stuff. And this time what I want to talk about is the exercising puppy stuff. But I think it's important for people to get an idea of who Ronnie is before we start listening to what Ronnie tells us. So Ronnie, who are you? What do you do? Where do you come from? I'm Ronnie Lejeune. I'm out in Lafayette, Louisiana. I'm a certified professional dog trainer with Sit Happens Dog Training, where we do basic obedience, behavior modification, board and train, and some specialty workshops that I particularly get involved with, such as canine conditioning, some leash walking, um, some really cool things that we get done. I have a particular interest in nutrition, which is where I created Perfectly Rawsome. Um, and I've recently started with my Mission Slim Possible uh, project, which is kind of still in the works. It's really nothing glamorous right now, but the focus is, is helping pet parents exercise their dogs to achieve fitness, both mentally and physically, but through exercise. So we could beat canine obesity because it's a huge epidemic. Yeah. Totally, totally. And I don't know, your your logo for Mission Slim Possible is pretty pretty awesome. <laughs> Isn't it great? Yes, yes. So <laughs> and I was very pleased with that. I have a local designer out here that I used to work with. And since I was so busy, I was like, hey, can you do this? And he <laughs> cranked that out and it was probably better than I could have ever created. So I was super stoked about that. I love it. The colors, the little space dog man. I loved it. I loved it. Right. Mission Slim Possible. I mean, <laughs> <it's awesome too. laughs> Coolest group name ever. <laughs> so what you're basically saying is that you know nutrition, you know dogs, and you know how to get them buff and jacked like Loki, which is one of her dogs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's really what I'm really specifically interested in. Maybe not necessarily always making every single dog buff and jacked, <laughs> but achieving fitness. And fitness doesn't mean that you have to be totally ripped, even for humans. Right. As long as you're, you could perform and recover in a good amount of time without being, you know, when I say a decent amount of time, typically recovery should be about 24 hours or less. If your recovery is longer than that, then I would say that you're not fit. Right. So fitness is not necessarily all the time what you look like, although that is a component. You can't <laughs> be overweight and be necessarily the fittest. No. Um, but you don't have to be super toned and ripped either to be the fittest. Right. So that's what I'm particularly interested in is helping pet parents achieve that depending on their goals. Now, if you want to start to get into competition type of training, which involves a lot of fitness related training, I could do that. But half the time, my pet parents are not doing that. They just have a dog that sits on the couch that's about 10, 15 pounds overweight. And we need to shed those pounds. Yeah. And they're not now. So speaking about the obesity epidemic, which is exactly like the perfect word for it, what kind of issues are we looking at with overweight, obese dogs? Because it goes, just like you're saying, it goes beyond just the aesthetic, how do you look type stuff. You know, how does your dog look having the chubby dog? But what kind of 
physical issues are we looking at by having a, a fat dog? I mean, it's the pretty much the same things that we have with humans. Arthritis, joint issues, joint injuries, um, cancer, diabetes, any type like liver failure, kidney failure, depending on how severe the obesity is, there's always going to be a health complication to follow. Right, right. So it's normally when your dog is obese or you as a human or overweight or obese, you typically have other issues. It's not just I have five pounds and I'm still functioning like a normal person. Things right. start to not work <laughs> and, <laughs> and other issues arise. The number one thing is joint and arthritis issues because the, the, ex, the skeleton is not equipped to carry even additional five pounds an additional five pounds is going to make uh, an extreme difference on your dog's body as well as yours. So that's really what it is, is. So if you have a functioning, healthy body, a moving body, your body's less, is not going to fall as much to sickness and illness as much as if you would be overweight because that lymphatic system's moving. You're, you know, the body's detoxing a lot better because the more you move, the more the lymphatic system moves right. and that pull out toxins um and it, of course it keeps your immune system because when you're moving you're out you're exposing yourself to things you're keeping your body and your immune system strong so i do believe that keeping your dog fit as well as a component co component of a good healthy diet is really the two one of the two main things to having a really healthy dog yeah, and that's a perfect segue into, you know, everybody that is watching this, unless it's your first video, so maybe you don't know this, but if it's not your first time on the Dog Dad channel, you know what we primarily talk about here is raw feeding. So why am I talking about exercising tips and fitness and health for dogs? And I, it's because I see in my Facebook group, Raw Feeding 101, all the time, people that are saying, you know, I want to, my dog needs to lose five pounds. My dog needs to lose seven pounds. I'm feeding this lowered percentage of food but the weight is not coming off and then you ask them what kind of exercise they're doing and you're like oh well i let them out three times a day to go to the bathroom and it's like well as beautiful and amazing and as life-changing as fresh food can be for a dog raw feeding can be for a dog you are not going to create a healthy dog with food alone just again like ronnie saying just like a person you can eat a perfect diet, but if you never do anything but eat that perfect diet while you're on the couch, you're still not going to be healthy. So I think marrying those two things together is essential, essential. Yep. I definitely agree with that a hundred percent. So let's get into super pun intended here. Let's get into the meat of this video and talk about some beginners exercise tips because again in my huge Facebook group just like Ronnie has a huge Facebook group raw feeding university I see all the time people asking about and I usually have to shut those posts down because they're not topic specific and then I send them to mission slim possible <laughs> but they ask what do I need to do to exercise my dog I switched over to raw foods um, I want to get this weight off them just the food isn't working what do I need to do do I need to go out do I need to get like a huge weighted training vest do I need to start going through pulling? Do I need to start having my dog run five miles tomorrow? You know, and there's so many levels to this that I don't even close to comprehend, which is why I'm bringing Ronnie on because this is what she does. So for a beginner, somebody that's never consistently exercised their dog, the classic couch potato dog, where should somebody start to safely, effectively, and be able to maintain it long-term, start exercising their dog? The first thing I tell people to start doing is getting up and walking your dog for at least 30 to 40 minutes every day. That's goal number one. And I want you to accomplish that for two weeks in a row. Love Nothing. it. Because if you're not in the habit of literally getting up and doing something with your dog, then I can't expect you to go and do more than just a walk. Right. So it takes at least 21 days maybe to form a habit mm -hmm. so doing a two-week walk every single day 30 minutes you don't have to power walk 
just getting your dog, walk, follow your dog's pace, whatever. It's getting you up with your dog. And in that process, it's actually helping the pet parent as well as the dog because a lot of people who do not consistently uh, walk their dogs or exercise their dogs, that, that we need to break that habit first. Right. The, so, the inactive habit. Right. So walking your dog, that's my step number one. And if you could get two weeks solid of walking your dog for 30 to 40 minutes every day, once you come to uh, week number three, what I tell people to start doing is making the walk structured. Now we're going to walk at a decent pace. We're not going to lollygag. I want you to still do the 30 to 40 minutes, but I want it a brisk, pretty fast paced walk. So you could actually start accomplishing some cardiovascular benefits. So we get in some endurance in there because if you're not walking a good enough speed for your heart rate to increase, then we're not really going to get the benefit of endurance training. So that first two weeks is really just breaking the bad habits of sitting on the couch and not doing anything. Right. Break that bad habit. Then we're going to start getting into harder or more advanced uh, exercises, which is simply what I just tell people, just increase the speed. Same amount of time, increase the speed. So you're going to be building some endurance. If you could do that, get up to a whole month of doing that. that what I would start doing is then you could start looking into what about if your dog swims? Can we take our dog swimming? Um, can we start teaching our dog to play fetch? Uh, can we do flirt pole with our dogs? And I am turning off. <laughs> Running is super that. popular. <laughs> Turn off this, all of it. Could you stop being so popular so that we could do this interview, Ronnie? <laughs> it was aggravating me. I was hoping it would stop. <laughs> um, so that's turned off. Um, but once we could, you could start looking into things like the flirt pole, um, which is just things to get the dog physically moving faster or doing it in a different sense. So swimming is a full body workout. Mm -hmm. It's uh, low impact and it actually burns a lot of calories even though it's not as stressful on the body um, fetch is a good way to build some different types of speed in the running as well as coordination with the dog because they have to learn how to uh, find the target pick the target up and deliver it back to the handler so that involves some kind of obedience so you can get into some more obedience things like drop or release sit and fetch pretty basic things and that helps build some mentals and bond with the dog flirt pole engages prey drive which we could actually increase the dog's speed when they're running and more coordination body so, awareness and stuff like that right so and though these are actually quite easy and they're easier for someone to get into versus going by all the body awareness equipment which i love body awareness but i think if you could get into those couple things that i mentioned first then you could start doing some body awareness things. I mean, you could try with like a book in your home. You don't have to go get the fancy equipment. And if you see your dog responds well and enjoys it, and if you enjoy it, then invest in the equipment. Because some of it's not cheap. <laughs> um, <laughs> like the fit bone equipment or, or the fit paws. <clears throat> their fit bone, their wobble pods, um, their individual pods, their wobble disc, and their peanuts and their donuts. They're all fantastic. They're, they're canine grade, but they're really thick. So if nails get dug into it, it won't necessarily deflate. Um, and I know what those are, but could you give a description of what those things are that you're talking about, the peanuts and the paws? And so the peanut, I'm pretty sure many people have seen, it's like the really oversized inflated fitness equipment. And it, dogs normally stand on all fours. I, I don't have any of my equipment out here. <laughs> It literally um, looks like an inflated peanut. Off. Right. And they're normally bright colors like yellow, blue, red. I have a red one, a lime green one. Um, they're really large and then normally dogs are on them. Mm -hmm. Whereas the donut's just a normal, a small round one. Okay. It's a little bit bigger. <laughs> and then the wobble discs are like individual, paw, like 22 inch disc that you inflate and they just wobble when they're so on it. And so the whole point is just them using different muscles, stabilizing themselves. Right. And it depends on what exercise you're doing. You're, you could either target the front end, the rear end, or the core. 
um, a lot of these wobble, unstable platforms do target the core muscles because they have to stabilize themselves. Um, right. So it's, body awareness is excellent for fitness and it's excellent for teaching your dog limb awareness and body, body awareness. And it helps translate into higher levels of exercises or training like agility and things like that because the bot, dog understands how to manipulate its body within space how to collect itself if it's going too fast, how to land if it jumped and it made a pivot, you know, like, so the dog starts to understand, I know where I am in space and I know how to manipulate my body in the right. safest way to complete it. That's what's really awesome about body awareness. You can cover form and you teach the dog form. And so in nice. that process, it, it looks really easy to the human eye, but I always tell my clients in my workshops to stand on the wobble disc and do squats three times in a row to see how fast their legs start burning. Right. <laughs> right. And they are surprised really quickly. It's really challenging. It looks super easy, but it's taxing on the muscles as well as the mind. So it's really, it's a great way to exercise your dog. Um, there is some human grade equipment that you could buy off of Amazon. Um, the wobble disc, the 22 inch wobble disc, you could definitely get a human grade one for about $25 on Amazon where it's significantly cheaper than the fit bone. I mean the fit paws disc. Um, those are the easy ones you could get from like Amazon if you want to get into that, those types of exercises. Um, so body awareness is great. I absolutely love that because you could use it for sporting dogs as well as if you know your veterinarian or if you have a rehabilitation trainer close to you and your dog has hip dysplasia or some issues with their joints, body awareness is excellent for that as well. Right. Because we could put the dog in an exercise program that allows them to use the muscles in range of motion that we need for healing or rehabilitation without the high impact. Right. And this comes to, you know, you're avoiding things that are everyday occurrences where you're just playing fetch with your dog and they happen to pivot in just that wrong way and they screw up their knee or they screw up their hip or their elbow or something because they didn't have that body awareness. They put too much stress in one particular area, tweak just the wrong way and you're going to the vet because you were playing fetch with the dog. Right. And it's not, not to say it's going to hundred percent stop injury. Right. Because if your dog, if you don't train appropriately, like if you're doing disc dog work or agility, that's why there, you should get a mentor or an appropriate trainer to show you how to do these things because you can injure your dog when exercising your dog. And the goal of these sports and the equipment is to exercise your dog, not to kill your dog. <laughs> so, <laughs> so whenever I tell people, you know, Hey, get guidance. It's not necessarily to be ugly about it. It's, it's really looking out for your dog. So if you're going to do high level, like agility stuff, don't just try to learn it willy nilly. With well, and it's looking out for your wallet because a vet visit like that is not a cheap visit. No, no, not at all. I just got a quote to get Loki's hips radiographed because he, I think his hip dysplasia is progressing. Mm. I hear grinding and it was $300. So we're going to have to save to get that done because it needs to be done. I need to know what's going on. But right. And yeah. that's, that's not an immediate thing that you like have to do right now because your dog can't walk because they tore a ligament in their elbow. Right. He's walking. And he's actually running in the backyard as we speak. The dog <laughs> looks like he has no problems with him. Like I know it's, I know from my experience with my joint issues with my elbow, when it cracks, it hurts. So hearing with certain times when he gets into the trot gate, it makes the grinding noise. And I just know that can't feel good <laughs> regardless. Right. Of, even though he has no other symptoms of pain or discomfort, I just got to get that looked at. Because it'll get there. One day oh, you'll see yeah. that when... The dysplasia is going to be a progressing... It progresses and gets worse over time. So it's been three years since I got our first x-ray. So it's about time anyway to get right. it. Like that again. Gotcha. 
So then coming back to these beginner strategies, number one is, and don't try anything else before that, is getting up and walking your dog for 30 to 40 minutes every day for two weeks straight and go at your dog's pace. It's not about the pace. It's about really just like so many things that we look at, including transitioning or off eating. It's more about the mental game first of getting out of those bad habits, educating yourself, getting into the right mindset and then moving on to more complicated stuff. Right. Exactly. Always start baby steps, especially with exercise. Same thing for people. Um, it's really hard to cut cold Turkey, like in clean diet and go straight into the gym every day. <laughs> Just break your bad habits slowly. Yeah. And it'll pay off in the long run. Instead of going from pizza and Pepsi to brown rice and chicken overnight. <laughs> yeah. I love it. I love it. So would you say, cause I can see this happening because I'm that kind of person that, you know, I buy, um, mighty paw supplied me with a training bag a little while ago. And it was just like, I felt this need to just go, go, go and start doing all these different training things. So I can only imagine how easy it is to get carried away and want to progress too quickly from one exercise and then increase the intensity. So what is a good way for people to know when it's a good time to start increasing activity? You know, when is your dog bored, not getting the benefits anymore because they're in shape enough now that the dog's not getting the same benefits? You'll, you'll notice your dog's pretty excellent at communicating. So it's just paying attention to what your dog's communicating. If you start doing a 30 minute walk, let's say you walk a mile in 30 minutes. And for the first couple of days, your dog is whipped after, you know, it lays down, it's not moving for a while. Although I do recommend making sure your dog cools off after a walk. Don't let it immediately lay down. Especially um, if it's triple digits and you live in Louisiana. Yes. <laughs> always do a cool down. Um, but after cool downs, if your dog's laying down and not really moving and is whipped after a 30 minute walk for a mile, I would say that you need to work at that until you see your dog is not so fatigued after that. So it's really paying attention to the fatigue levels. So it goes back to that original statement where fitness is not necessarily how you look, it's how you perform and how you recover. So if your performance it, within 30 minutes and a mile is really slow and you're very fatigued and you need more recovery, <laughs> don't push it any further. But if it's the other way around is if your dog's performing excellent with a mile and wants to go like, it's not, it's like, dude, this is cakewalk. You, what you got, you know, <laughs> you get home and they're still bouncing off the wall. Right. Yeah. You'll know if your dog's tired or not. So if your dog's performance is exp higher in that amount of time and recovery is not necessary or very low, then I would say yes, increase intensity. So it's always paying attention to your dog's fatigue and recovery <clears throat> and performance. So just because you have a, you know, skinny bit dog does not automatically mean that they're a super athlete already. Oh, no, you, you can have – skinny doesn't mean fitness. Right. Skinny, no, skinny <laughs> doesn't mean fitness. People, and a lot of people think that, which I think that has a lot to do with just media standards and human body image. And we translate that into our dogs. Yeah, and it's a little weird in the dog community because we a lot of people think, you know, a heavier dog is fit or muscle. Muscle, that's what I get. It's all muscle. I'm like, no, it's really not. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's really weird in the dog world, but when you start to get into the fitness side and get, in, get into that, if you see a thin dog or just a dog that's not necessarily overweight, doesn't necessarily mean that they're fit either because you could have some dogs that might, might not be toned and buff, but could go three, four miles. And that little skinny dog can't even go a mile. Right. So it's all conditioning. It's all about where your dog is at. It's not about the aesthetic. Right. And, and aesthetic always comes with it. Of course, your dog's not going to be extremely overweight if it's running five miles a day or right. doing extensive uh, swimming or agility training. You know, these dogs are going to be naturally fit because they're burning calories. 
the, the calories they intake is just becoming energy. And it's really, <laughs> that's why you always hear these people who with really active dogs, they say, I can't keep weight on my dog. Well, it's just because they're moving. That metabolism is going. You're, they're right. burning and they're burning. Like right now in the summertime, I feed my dogs the most that I've ever fed, fed in a while because Loki had, was injured with his CCL. So of course I couldn't do what I do now, but now right. he's healed. And I could take him swimming every other day. And he's over two and a half pounds a day. Pika is at 28 ounces. Pika's 35 pounds. Loki's 65 pounds. So it's, I'm, I feed a lot of food. Right. But you've see, I'm sure many people have seen pictures of my dogs and they're not remotely close to being overweight. No. <laughs> so could you imagine the amount of food I would have to feed my dogs to make them heavier? And take out all the exercise. And, yeah. Right. I love it. So just because you see, and just making the point one more time, because I, I agree with you with the translating it from the human perspective of, you know, the skinny models must be fit, which is not the case. Just because you see this super lean, you know, Italian greyhound or a whippet or something like that does not automatically mean that you can take that dog on a five-mile jog tomorrow. And not yeah. Have problems. Right. Because I see that I see that a lot. Maybe not necessarily just in the group, but just in the dog world as a whole, is people look at breeds and automatically assume conditioning and ability. And it's just it's not the case. Just because you have a German shepherd does not mean that they are a protection trained attack dog that is going to it just because you have a Labrador does not mean they're gonna go hunt duck for you. <laughs> I mean right. it, breeds do not equal conditioning and yeah I just I just wanted to make that point because I think I see it way too much way too much yeah and I think a lot of things on the internet when it comes to the perspective of fitness and dogs there is a lot of dangerous videos out there um a lot of flashy videos like they a lot of people are doing it for the cool factor check how high my melon walk could jump and there's like <laughs> There's no jump pad underneath. So the dog's like full blown impact onto the ground. Like that's not safe. Th yeah. That just reads to me like ego <laughs> and yeah. you're putting your dog's joints at risk and bones at risk. Um, so it's doing things correct. Like I said, the equipment and these sports are there to exercise and keep our dog healthy, not kill him. Right. <laughs> So, yeah, every time I see those videos, that there's just a little part of me that just like cringes, like, oh, is something bad going to happen when that dog hits the ground? Like, oh, yeah, I yeah. totally get it. And it's just with all breeds. Like, I love weighted backpacks, uh, weighted vest. I have one. I will always use it, but I only use it with my dogs wearing it on a leash, walking, nothing more. And I can't. I get really upset <laughs> when I see dogs wearing these heavily weighted vests running jumping because doing of the like, joint impact yeah i mean the idea is to put add resistance and when you add let's say anywhere from six to ten percent of the body weight on your dog that's resistance so just walk the dog you can walk the dog the same distance with the vest on and it's going to be more impactful than without the vest yeah um I don't need to go run and jump my dog with an additional five pounds because that puts my dog's joints back at risk. Yep. The equipment's there to exercise my dog, not kill it. Um, I've, I've seen, ironically, I saw a video with a dog with a weighted vest swimming. Oh. That blew my mind. I won't even go into that in any more detail. <laughs> and do you think that people way overkill it with the weight in the vests? Because, I mean... Some people hear five pounds and they're like, well, that's not hardly any weight. But, you know, to those people, I would say go to Walmart or go to Target or wherever it is in your area that sells weights, pick up a five pound weight and hold your arm out and see how long you last. It's only five pounds, but in a minute, your arm's going to be on fire. This will get into some subject like for pulling sports, your dog for carrying on their shoulders now needs to be appropriately fitted because it's too big, you can hurt your dog. Um, they could carry up to, any, if, if I'm remembering correctly, 21, 
to 22% of their body weight, that's significant. Yeah. But you don't go strap that on first go. (laughs) 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 You build up to that. And to be fair, not many breeds could do that either. It really depends on the breed. So you'll, you'll see huskies, you know, these dogs that are, were, are bred to pull these working type of dogs. They will be able to hold and pull a lot more than smaller dogs that are more de- designed for endurance type of exercises. Or even equal sized dogs bred for something completely different like Labradors. Right. Well, I mean, a lab could still probably carry the same amount, but what I'm saying is, is like, don't, I wouldn't compare the weight, pull, the weight holding ability of a, say, a Whippet to a Husky. Right. Totally makes sense. Um, now, and then there's some exceptions to that. Uh, I know someone that has a Whippet and he uses a weighted vest every day on his dog. He, he's exceptionally active with his dog. And I do believe his whippet is somewhere close to 15% in the weighted vest, but don't get, he started at 5% and has slowly incremented, but his dog is insanely active. They, they walk anywhere from six to 10 miles a day and he's, yeah, he's in lower coursing. So this dog is doing things and you could, you know, he is physically conditioned to handle it. Right. So crazy. So it's basically just like raw feeding in the aspect of observing and adjusting. Yeah. And it's not going to be the same for every dog. Maybe someone's dog can't start at 5% and they have to start at 2.5% or something like that. I, so, so intriguing to me. Like my, there, there's all kinds of ideas going off in my head. Right <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, and another thing is it's not only – to push it too much is to take, you know, you want to take it slow, very slow. Um, because especially with fitness, if you overdo it, the expense is injury. Right. Or, and the same, I guess you could say the same about raw feeding, because if you feed the wrong things, we can cause injury. Mm -hmm. Too much, Um, too little. Right. But it would have, you would have to be wildly incorrectly feeding at one feeding to really hurt your dog. Right. It would, it takes one time to go do something incorrectly with an exercise with your dog to hurt them. Yep. And it happens quickly. And it's really painful for your dog, really expensive on your wallet and you feel terrible. Right. So it's always best to just start slow. If you want to start getting into more advanced type of things is to always find a mentor or a trainer that way you can get set up appropriately i love all the the big active sports i mean i longboard your like my dogs pull me on my longboard i love that um it's making sure you have the appropriate equipment because if you don't have the appropriate equipment and it's not sized properly again we could hurt our dog inadvertently because we don't intend to but that's why there are certain harnesses for pull sports and different harnesses for different pull sports you have a weight pulling harness you have a drawing harness, um, carding harnesses, they're all different and they distribute the weight differently on the body depending on where the weight that they're pulling is behind them. Right. So what I'm hearing with all of this is start slow and once you get past basics of, you know, walking your dog for that consistent two week period, don't just try and figure it out yourself by superhero YouTube videos and stuff like that. Actually talk to people and get information. Right. And I'm sure you're aware. I don't, I mean, I just recently started doing swimming with Loki because I never thought he'd swim in his life until recently. And Loki the sea cow. (laughs) Yeah. So since he retrieves and he swims, I'm, I want to get into dock diving. It's a good exercise I could provide him without being stressful on his hips and his joints. It's actually been proven very good rehabilitation for him. Right. And as well as keeping him active and nice and healthy. Um, so I posted in Mission Slim Possible to ask for other people's advice on how to get my dog to start jumping off the bank, off the dock because he's not wanting to. Well, he started, we worked on it, but I will be the first one to ask other trainers or other people with more experience in something that I don't know for help. Right, so do not make this about ego. It's not an ego thing. 
<clears throat> you don't have to know everything from the get go. Nope, and not and <laughs> not this Saturday, but next Saturday, I'm taking Loki to a doc dog, our local doc dog event. Right. Um, so I'll be working with more people who do this for competition in competition. So I get one on one work with these, you know, people with actual experience because I could take him to the pond every day and throw a ball in the water and he runs and he fetches, but I can't get to the level that we want to get to because I don't know how to train for dog dog type of stuff. I could train a retrieve. <laughs> That's easy. I've done that already. He does it. But <laughs> for the semantics of, okay, now you got to leap off and go get it or jump You see higher. this thing 10 feet out there? I want you to catch that. <laughs> right. And he, I mean, he does it on land. He'll jump in the air for he. I was in training to get him to do be a frisbee dog, and that's actually how he he messed up his CCL. And he he used to catch, jump in the air to catch his ball when playing fetch. So I know he physically can do it. It's the translation into aqua life. <laughs> <laughs> Turning Loki the sea cow into the sea cow. Spread your wings <laughs> and fly, my pig. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. And if you guys do not understand these jokes, go and check out Ronnie on Facebook and you will see the hilarity. It's amazing. <laughs> so Ronnie, tell us about, to close this up here, tell us about Mission Slim Possible, what it is, what the goal is, where people can find it and what they can expect when they get there. So Mission Slim Possible is a Facebook group for pet parents, whether you're feeding your dog kibble, home cooked or raw to help get your dog physically fit or lose weight. So we have members both with dogs that are overweight or dogs that are fit. But the goal for the group is to help support one another to help maintain and achieve physical fitness for our dogs. Nutrition topics are open for discussion. Um, and like I said, it's on different diets because I understand fitness is not going to be directly always with raw feeders. There's right. a lot more pet parents in this world that need help still getting their dog to lose weight, even if they're not on raw because they can't afford it. What other reasons? So you can find us on Facebook for that. We're in, I'm in the process and I'm hoping to have start a website for it next year. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. And that's a big point that I want to make here, even though this is a, it's a raw feeding channel. It's the whole point of this channel existing, but mission slim possible is not raw feeders exclusive. So if you're still completely feeding kibble or if you're completely feeding kibble, but then you're adding in low glycemic veggies or eggs or coconut oil or whatever, to, whatever the heck you are feeding, you can still go to mission slim possible for exercise and fitness advice for right. dogs. So in Mission Slim Possible, I have what we call the weekly wag. And yeah. each day is dedicated to a day for health and fitness. Monday is Motivational Monday, where we post motivational quotes and memes to Love help it. inspire. Tuesday is Trick Dog Tuesday. So we post about tricks, what our dogs are learning. Tricks could be a world of things. I mean, teaching your dog how to sit is technically a trick. So, Trick Dog Tuesday. Weigh in Wednesday is for our members who are in a in weight loss or even fitness. You just weigh in on Wednesday with your progress update. I love it. Thursday is Training Treat Thursdays. So, any homemade recipes you're doing for treats or any new brands that you're trying for training treats. That's where we, we post them on Thursdays. Fridays is Fit Dog Friday, so that's where we get to show off our fit dogs. Because <laughs> there's one thing I wanted to make sure that Slim Possible doesn't turn into is a group that is just spammed with fit dogs. Right. Check out my buff and jacked puppy. <laughs> Which I want people to show off because that, that shows hard work and dedication, and I love right. that. But I also don't want our members with dogs that do need help to feel like they're on the back seat. Right. Because the main part of this group is to get those people on the front seat for Fit Dog Friday. Right. Not a self self advertising look how epic my dog is board. Right. And Saturdays is scrumptious Saturdays, which is focused on <laughs> 
<laughs> feeding and fresh food. So if we're adding fresh food to a kibble diet, if we're feeding a cooked diet, if we're feeding a raw diet. So you could share anything about that on food on Saturdays and Sundays is uh, it's an off topic day and I totally forgot the acronym that I came up for it. No, <laughs> they can't be better than scrumptious Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> You could tell I really thought about all this. You did. <laughs> so, Sunday. Oh, Sunday is Sunday fun day. So. <laughs> uh, scrumptious Saturday still wins for me. <laughs> and, and Sunday fun day is off topic pet chat. So it's really just something that we could go there. So people could go and post something about dogs or. I whatever. love it. I love it. I love it. So where in can you just because I know that this is going to come up, I will put a link in the description box, but how do you actually spell Mission Slim Possible? So Mission, M-I-S-S-I-O-N, Slim Possible is S-L-I-M-P-A-W-S-I-B-L-E. I knew that we were going to get that question of, is it possible, P-A-W, is it P-O-S-S? -S? So I just wanted to make that it's super duped clear. <laughs> because it's puppies. It's so and clever. You, and speaking of puppies, if you listen. And that was perfect. As soon as you got quiet, she rang through. I love it. I love it. <laughs> so on that note, I'm going to close this out. I don't want to make this too ridiculously long because... I know that Ronnie and I both have the tendency to go down the rabbit hole and just talk about this thing and that thing. So thank you, Ronnie, so much for doing this. We will definitely be doing more videos. If you guys haven't already checked out our podcast, go check out the Raw Feeding Breakfast Bowl that we do with Kimberly Gautier, where these gals have some pretty awesome stuff to share. So thank you again, Ronnie. Can't wait to do another video. But most importantly, everybody, Remember that you don't have to be perfect to be an amazing dog owner. You just have to do your best every day and try to improve as you go forward. Peace. Bye, Bye guys.